Good evening. I'm going to invite you to turn with me back to the book of Acts. We're going to be in Acts chapter 2 this evening. Acts chapter 2, and whenever we come to a, a service like this where we're observing the Lord's table, one of the things that we're very intentional to do is to draw our attention specifically and very focusedly back on the sacrifice of Christ on the giving of his life for our redemption. You've, you've heard that already in the scripture reading as you hear Acts chapter 10, as you hear Romans chapter 5, as you hear the selection of songs that are all drawing our attention and our focus back into, all right, this is what Christ has done for us. This is what Christ has done for sinners. This is how we are redeemed, how we are pardoned, how we're brought into one body, how we have the one faith that has been once delivered. As we've been reminded as we've begun this uh, journey through the book of Jude. And we need regularly to be, to, remi to be reminded of the great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. As Brother Eric already prayed and made mention of, our, our hearts easily wander away. Our attention is easily diverted from the great and all-sufficient Christ to other lesser things. And one of the gifts that we have ordained by the Lord to redirect that gaze, to refocus us, is this taking of the Lord's table. That's why we do it. That's why it's a regular rhythm of the body of Christ gathering. In God's Word, it says, as often as you will, do this in remembrance of me. We're going to read that in just a few moments when we actually take the elements together. But the purpose for that is so that we do exactly what it says, in remembrance of Him. So that we're brought into remembrance and that so through being brought into remembrance, our hearts and our faith are ministered to. That our hearts and our faith is refocused and realigned on the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And here in Acts chapter 2, I'm going to draw our attention to what I, what I think is one of the key sections in Peter's sermon. This sermon is probably one of the greatest, or at least one of the most powerfully used sermons by any man. And it's the sermon that Peter's going to bring on the day of Pentecost. Here in Acts chapter 2, you have the Spirit of God as promised by the Son of God has descended on the people of God. They've been waiting in Jerusalem until the Spirit descends on them. And here they've gathered in the upper room. They've been waiting for this. There's been a period of days that have passed since Jesus has returned to the right hand of the Father. And He's told them, after the Spirit has come upon you, you're going to be witnesses of Me. You're going to go and do what I've already been commanding you to do throughout this period of time from the resurrection until Jesus' departure. To go and be witnesses, to proclaim the gospel that Jesus is. The Spirit descends on the people of God. They go out into the streets of Jerusalem. They, they've, the people of Jerusalem have gathered in at this noise and as these people are filled with the Spirit of God and miraculously given this ability to speak in languages that these people can understand, having been gathered from across the Roman Empire, they begin to hear them speaking of the mighty deeds of God in all that are in language. And as they continue in amazement, verse 12 tells us, in great perplexity, saying to one another, what does this mean? Peter stands up in the midst of them, verse 14 taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, Men of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. He counters one of the accusations that came in the verse just before this. Ah, these, these men are full of sweet wine. Then he says in verse 15, These men are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. And then he goes in from verse 17 down to verse 21. He's going to quote the Old Testament and say, this is what's going on. What had been foretold hundreds of years before is now taking place in front of you. Rounding out that quotation in verse 21, he says, and it shall be that everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. Peter makes this declaration and, and, and says, now this is being fulfilled in our midst right now. Everyone who calls in the name of Yahweh will be saved. 
And then it's almost as if in your mind's eye you can see more have gathered into the fringes of the crowd and Peter is going to make this brand new assertion. The first assertion that he's really making after having read his text beginning in verse 22. This is where our focus is going to be, verses 22 through 24. Where after quoting the Old Testament to explain what they're seeing and letting them know that what was taking place, what they're seeing, what they're experiencing, and why this is all happening, the fulfillment of that hundreds of years old prophecy, it's because of Christ's death and resurrection. It's because of who Jesus is. What Peter's doing is he's going to be making a case that this Jesus, whom they knew, was indeed the Christ. Then he's indicting them with the reality that they rejected and put that Jesus to death. So who is this Jesus? And what does this death mean? In three verses here, Peter will, in the introduction, one of the most, as I mentioned, powerfully used sermons show Jesus' personal, predetermined, and powerful death. That's going to be the three headings that I want us to consider in our, in our time together before we come to the Lord's table. That Jesus' Jesus's death was personal, was predetermined, and it was powerful. One of the things that's amazing about this is that this is all a statement. It's all an indicative. It's all a declaration of this is what Jesus did. This is who He is. This is what you all did. There's not really here any kind of command offered. Instead, through His words, Peter is going to be declaring to them what will eventually bring them to cry out, interrupting what Peter is saying, to say, what do we need to do? How may we respond to receive pardon? How may we be partakers of what Christ has accomplished? The first thing that Peter draws out, beginning in verse 22, is that this is personal. Verse 22, as he begins, Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know, this man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. It's no wonder when you read verses like that that later on Luke is going to record that they were cut to the heart. Peter, remember, this is the very first assertion that he's making after saying, remember what Joel said? Well, you're seeing it take place in front of you, and now here's what it has to do with you. Just in the beginning there, verse 22, men of Israel, listen to these words, Jesus the Nazarene. One of the reasons that I, that I, I call this personal here, that, that I bring our attention, draw our focus into the reality that this is personal, is because we need to be reminded of the awesome miracle of Jesus' sacrifice as a man. God took on flesh, was born in a manger. So often we relegate that to one season of the year. But understand, whenever our hearts and minds are drawn to remembrance to the Lord's table, in order for Him to die, He had to take on flesh. He had to become like us so that He could die as us. He had to be brought into the confines of humanity in this indescribable miracle of the uniting of humanity with God. Without the mixing of either one, without creating something brand new, without compromising either. This is a great mystery. He was an actual man, confined to a literal history and a literal place. And in that confining, it was, it was certainly not noble. Jesus the Nazarene. Remember, what does one of the disciples say at hearing, I found the Messiah? He's from Nazareth. And the overwhelming response to that is, uh, does anything good come out of there? Does anything good come out of Nazareth? Here's Jesus, 
the creator of heaven and earth as we've just sung praises to him and he goes to a place of no reputation to be a man of no reputation to take on the curse of the law for us. He was a man attested by signs and wonders in their midst. Verse 22 continues, He was a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst just as you yourselves know. Now now understand, sometimes I think we can have maybe a localized version of what's going on. It's a wonder that the God who created all of the expanse of the universe, he confined his time as a man to a narrow, narrow place in his creation. That Jesus, as far as we know, never left the region that at that time was known as Palestine, a small Roman province. It's amazing, you read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and all of it is taking place, all centralized, really around the Sea of Galilee, and expanding a little bit to the north, and as far south as Jerusalem, a little bit across the Jordan during his time of temptation, and baptizing, and things like that. But apart from that, it's not until you get to the book of Acts that you leave the confines of this region. And I think sometimes because of that, we can have this idea that nobody really knew outside of this region what was going on. But when we look at the the whole of the biblical account, one of the things that we find is that his fame had spread far. When we walked through the Gospel of Matthew with Pastor Philip, one of the things that was brought out was that at the time of the Feast of the Passover, when Christ was crucified, there was... Literally millions of people that had gathered from across the Roman Empire into this place. And then, on the morning of his resurrection, as Jesus is walking along with the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, do you remember what they ask him when he says, what are you guys talking about? Are you the only one here who doesn't know what's been taking place? In other words, their natural expectation is, everybody knows who's going on. All the millions who've gathered in Jerusalem, they have a recognition of this guy whom we believed was a prophet because of the signs and wonders that he did. Chapters after this, what was read to us by Brother Stephen in Acts chapter 10, when Cornelius, who's a Roman, but a god fear who lives in another region north and west of Jerusalem, is going to hear the gospel from the mouth of the same one speaking in our text, Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 10. Peter's really going to follow the same course of, of delivery when he says he was a man who went about doing good. He was doing all these signs and wonders, as you know. Extra biblical accounts tell us that he was even requested from as far away as Syria and the far northern regions of that, uh, of that land. By the time we get further into the book of Acts, we know that there was at least the disciples of John that were as far away as the Asian province, what is now modern day Turkey, who were preaching what John had preached. So it's little surprise to know that millions would have known, I've, I've heard about this miracle worker from Nazareth, Think about all that Jesus was doing. You think the word of that wasn't spreading. And here, Peter bringing that indictment says, you yourselves know. You were eyewitnesses. Which makes this next thing that he's going to draw the knife deeper even more poignant. Verse 23, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. This one whom you say you're anticipating, this one whom you knew had been working miracles, this one you all cried out with one voice, crucify him. No, you didn't swing the hammer that drove the nails. You called for godless or lawless men to do that. In doing this, Peter's really doing what Paul does in Romans chapter 1. He's in in 2 and 3. He's drawing the circle of guilt around everybody. The Jews, oh yes, you nailed him to a cross. By the hands of godless men, oh yeah, those Gentiles. They were men who acted unlawfully. As Pastor Philip has reminded us recently, And there's no way that we can stand back and say, well, I wouldn't have done that. No. Even as we sing, 
Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. Had we been there, we would not have been the lone advocate. What did the prophet say for seeing the centuries before? No, the shepherd will be struck and the sheep will be scattered. Even his own disciples, they ran and hid. For each of us, we would be personally guilty participants in this. All are indicted by this. But what's marvelous is what Peter just mentioned at the beginning of verse 23. Our second point that this is predetermined. Jesus' death was personal. It was the God-man put to death with the guilt of all mankind. But it was according to, as Peter says, it was delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. Beloved, this was always the plan. The cross, I, I, I'd never tire of bringing this out. It wasn't plan B. With an almighty, sovereign, and all-wise God, there need not be a plan B. This was the course that was determined. The word that's used here is translated elsewhere in our Bible as appointed. In other words, this was all according to the schedule. This was set by specific boundaries. Think of the instances in Christ's ministry when He passed through their midst as they sought to kill Him and they couldn't. Whether that's in the villages outside of Jerusalem where they wanted to throw Him over a cliff and they, they couldn't. The Scripture doesn't even elucidate that and tell us, well, yeah, here's, here's how. He got lost in the mad rush of the crowd. No, no, we don't know. We just know what the Gospel writers tell us, that His hour was not yet come. When they wanted to seize him as he was teaching in the temple, but they couldn't. Why? Because his hour was not yet come. But then we read in places like John chapter 13, knowing that all things had been given into his hands. And that what was about to take place was about to take place. He continued on the path of the plan. This was all according to schedule. This is according to the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. This is knowledge beforehand, but it, sometimes I think we, we, we get the idea that it's sort of like the pseudo-psychics and mediums pretend this, this sort of, well, I can tell you all the details that will happen. Rather, this is an intimate knowledge. This is an intimate acquaintance of, no, 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 I have appointed and I have arranged and I have ordained. As Peter makes clear, this was done by the foreknowledge, the predetermined plan of God. This was initiated by God. This was not at the request of men. This was not at the initiation of, well, I've got a really good plan, God. If you'll just jump on board. I know it's asking a lot, but rather this is according to His great love with which He loved us. One pastor from the 1800s, Octavius Winslow, says this, So completely was Jesus bent upon saving sinners by the sacrifice of himself. He created the tree upon which he was to die and nurtured from infancy the men who were to nail him to the accursed wood. We think often are reminded of Jesus' own words that don't you know that if I wanted to I could call legions of angels John records for us the absolute power that Jesus possessed that as his arresters came to grab him, lay hold of him, and they say, are you Jesus? And he answers, I am, and they fall back. We know what the scripture says that will happen at the end of the age. He's going to speak and bring all of his enemies to their destruction. He didn't need an army. All he needed to do was speak. Years ago, I remember reading one writing about the arrest of Christ. And he said, remember that the last free act that Christ did before his hands were bound was the healing of one who came to arrest him. And then he drew attention to the fact, this author drew attention to the fact that imagine how foolish that would have seemed. 
Here's a man who can restore to perfect health one who's injured, one who's wounded. Many of them had been, again, the eyewitnesses of these things, and they think, no, 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 we've got this. We've got rope. Well, this reality that was predetermined, it's not just some theological stick to swing. This is a comforting promise and a reality that the Father was ordaining every bit of the sinful acts of godless or lawless men to turn these deeds to His glory. It wasn't a mad scramble that, well, how can I fix this? They've rejected my King. Instead it was, this is as I ordained it. This is all according to the plan. What a mighty God. And he actually died. Peter brings this out when he says, you, you put him to death. Again, we, we have to begin with that reality of this is God taking on flesh. It was a terrible death. As Peter brings out, he was nailed to a cross. This is a death that Roman citizens couldn't even be assigned because it was so unspeakably awful. And I use those words in particular because in polite Roman society, you weren't supposed to mention crucifixion. Most often in the New Testament, there's euphemisms like is used here. The word that Peter uses is fastened. Later on in Acts chapter 10, when he's relaying this to Cornelius, he says, he was hung from a stake, hung from a tree. It was such an awful death. This predetermined personal death. There wasn't even supposed to be spoken of. And beloved, we remember he did it. As we were reminded from Romans chapter 5, while we were yet sinners, while we were ungodly, when we had no strength in of ourselves to accomplish it, And what makes this death so amazing is, and the third point, because it's so powerful, Peter doesn't leave this hanging very long in verse 24 before he says, but God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible. It did not have the power for him to be held in its power. God raised him up. See, this death is powerful specifically because he did not stay dead. He died, and in dying, he accomplished the satisfaction of the wrath of God on our behalf. But that's not all. He was raised for our justification, for our positive righteousness, that we would have life in his name. He put an end to the agony of death, Peter tells us. He released us, loosed us from the agony, the terror of death. Because death is not the end in Christ's history. It's necessary, but it's not the final statement. In fact, the reality is Christ's death, had it only been a death, it would have been... Uh, we have no hope. That's what Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15. If there's no resurrection, if Christ is not raised, we're still in our sins. When we come to the table, we're brought of necessity to remember His death, but we cannot stop there. Far too often we remember and are reminded of Christ on the tree, whether that's in crucifixes or images or just in our imagination. But beloved, He didn't stay there. That's what makes this death so unique. Christ Himself in Revelation chapter 1 is going to, as He identifies Himself to John, say, I'm the living one. I was dead and behold, I'm alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and of Hades. In other words, this death conquered death. Because it was impossible for Him to be held in its power. This is the declaration, the original assertion of Peter in this great and amazing Pentecost sermon. That Jesus' death is personal. It's predetermined. It's powerful. 
I believe this is the central point of what Peter is speaking about here because he's making these assertions that this Jesus whom you crucified is the Lord in whom there is salvation. This is why we do this. Because these figures of bread and the fruit of the vine, what they bring our mind back to is specifically His death and the hope of resurrection. As I mentioned, we're remembering and we're being ministered to by them and by our faith-filled participation in this table. By taking it, we're saying His body was broken for me. His blood was poured out for me. My hope is in Him. We are petitioning as we partake. My my hope is in Him, except me on the basis of Him, because it's not in me. I love words and the meaning of words and the roots of words. The word tangible comes from a Latin word meaning to touch. Through the table we're being tangibly touching. Tangibly reminded with signs that He died for our pardon. He died for our freedom, for our justification. And we can't help but remember He didn't stay dead. Because of His death, we celebrate His death and look forward to life. Not just a life renewed and pardoned in this life, but life everlasting. Because whatever this life will hold, it holds no candle to what eternity will be for those who are in Christ. Beloved, as we partake of the table, we're ministered in all these areas. It's not a ritual. It's not some rigmarole. It's a God-ordained reminder. It's a God-ordained indicator, statement, declaration, rehearsal of our hope. When we take the Lord's table, when we partake of these elements, we're observing, we're remembering this personal, predetermined, powerful death with the reassurance of the resurrection. And in just a moment when I pray and the elders and deacons come forward and we partake of this table. Look in hope. Take in hope. But beware. Remember, this isn't a rigmarole. This isn't just something that we do. This is a signal. It's a reminder. It's a reminder that our hope is in Him. Beloved, if your hope is in Him, partake. Be reminded. Rejoice. And hope. But examine. If your hope is not in Him. Don't just idly sit and say, but well, it's not. Rather, cry out in faith and repentance. Believe and be saved. Pray with me. Heavenly Fathers, we've been reminded tonight You're a God who powerfully saves. Who perfectly has planned out and personally sent your Son to be our Savior. To be the Savior of all those who call upon you, who are all who are drawn by your name. And Father, as your word has been proclaimed this evening, draw those who do not know you. Grant them faith and repentance that they would be partakers of everlasting life. We thank you for the gift of this memorial. For this ordinance, for this remembrance. That we joyfully obey the command to remember. Remember.
And in the moments ahead, may your people be refreshed. May our hope, may our joy be full as we look and remember. And we ask these things in the name of your Son. Amen.